I'm about to tell you a story that I've only told three other people on this earth. The shrink I was seeing after college, a tattoo artist one lonely night in Clearwater, Florida, and my wife. And of those three, I think she's the only one that believes me. However, if you told me the story I'm about to share with you, I doubt I would believe it either. You might wonder why, after keeping it to myself for so many years, I decided to share it now. Actually, the answer is pretty simple. Just the other day, while throwing a frisbee on the beach with my kids, my son asked me why I never wear a short sleeve shirt. He questioned why, no matter the weather, no matter where we are, or the time of year, I've got on a long sleeve shirt. I was a little shocked when he asked me, but I guess I shouldn't have been. Kids that age have a million questions about a million things. It makes perfect sense to ponder why a grown man is wearing shorts and long sleeves on a bright and beautiful day in July, while the hundreds of people on the sand surrounding him are exposing most of their bodies to the warmth of the sun. On the occasion the question came up initially, I brushed it off and told him his daddy was just always cold. That was good enough in the moment, and we moved on with the day. Of course, the truth goes deeper and darker. I intend to tell both of my children the truth, but not till they're a little bit older. No sense in scaring them now. Still, we live in a world where everything can change in the blink of an eye. So should something happen to me, I want this story to be out there. Let me take you back to the beginning. It was late October in 2006. I was pretty fresh out of college, and I just started working for a museum outside of Washington, D.C. It wasn't what I was looking for, but I was paying the bills while I waited for my girlfriend to finish school herself. That said, I was always watching the internet for better opportunities in tourism. That's where I stumbled across the ad for an entry-level ranger position at a maritime museum run by the Park Service in Salem, Massachusetts. I've always loved history, been fond of waterfront areas and marinas, so I immediately sent a resume. To my surprise, I was granted an interview and arranged for a Monday morning meeting just before the end of the month. Of course, Massachusetts wasn't right around the corner from my studio apartment outside D.C., so I decided to make a weekend of it with my girl. Her school was basically on the way from Washington to New England, so I could pick her up Saturday morning and we could head up I-95 and spend the weekend in the area. After all, it was fall. The local trees were beautiful, and the weather had not yet turned bitter cold. You ever hear that saying about plans going astray? Well, that's what they did. I received a text from her late Friday night that she had crammed for a midterm and could not join me. It turns out she was actually banging an accounting major, which would come to light just in time for Christmas. Rumor has it she married him and moved to Texas. Yeehaw. In hindsight, best thing she ever could have done for me. Point is, I ended up driving to Salem by myself on Saturday. I already paid for the hotel had the interview set up for Monday, and didn't have anything better to do. The drive was a hell of a lot longer than I thought, even without the side trip to her university. Factor in a dose of northeast traffic, by the time I got to the neighboring town of Danvers, I was exhausted, and just checked into my hotel. I walked to a nearby big box restaurant to stretch my legs, grab a burger, and a couple of Miller Lights. Truthfully, I had my insecure suspicions about my soon-to-be ex-girlfriend's last-minute cancellation, so it was best I stop after only a couple beers, before I started drunk texting and making a fool of myself. After dinner, I went back to the room, started to watch an old rerun of Carpenter's Halloween on the hotel TV, falling asleep somewhere in the middle. On Sunday morning, after slowly dragging myself out of bed, I flipped on the local news. The weatherman said it was going to be a beautiful day, 
unseasonably warm for that time of year, actually creeping into the mid-70s around noon. With a weather report like that, I knew I wanted to be outside, so I shook off the previous night's suspicions and decided to go make a day of it in Salem by myself. Most other Sundays in the fall, I would have sat around and watched the Redskins, but this opportunity seemed too nice to pass up. I threw on a pair of jeans and a brand new Washington Nationals shirt I had picked up the week before on clearance. I was still getting used to having a local professional baseball team, so I was gobbling up all the national stuff I could. I remember what I wore vividly. The red shirt with the blue and white lettering, because it would be the last t-shirt I ever put on. By the time I was fully motivated and actually got into town, it was late morning. The day was indeed beautiful, and I spent a good portion of it just wandering around. Salem, Massachusetts is a great town for walking. Within the town limits are the original burial ground, containing the remains of a few hundred including some prominent historical figures from the region. The stones are old and worn, and the trees tall and jagged. It feels truly old world. On the brick-laid sidewalks, there was much history to see, and so many electric stores to go in and out of. Of course, given the town's past, most of the stores are witch-themed. Some of them even cater to modern Wiccans. Herbs, books of spells, amulets and pendants are the norm in a lot of the shops. And there are books on the town's history, and that of the surrounding region. I went through a few of the local tourist traps as well, including a wax museum and an attraction dedicated to the history of the witch trials, blowing money I didn't really have at the time. It's really quite fascinating. I find it amazing how the basic concepts around the 17th century witch hunt continue this day, how one incident can ignite such passion and hatred in human beings and create such hysteria. Just look at how quickly some modern folks are to label every Muslim as a terrorist or how others want to remove guns from society because of the actions of the lunatics that actually pull the trigger. In truth, we really haven't changed all that much from the misguided Puritans that settled this country. I digress. The town itself was packed. Hundreds of people, probably due to the proximity to Halloween. Men, women, and children. Hundreds of them wandering the streets, and dozens of those dressed for the season wizard and warlock outfits, and all manner of witch attire. Everything from kids with pointy hats and fake war-covered noses to the ever-present sexy witch with skin-tied dresses with slits to their hip. Not that I was complaining. It was hard not to get wrapped up in the uniqueness of this village and its atmosphere. As the day drew a close, I got a cup of coffee at one of the local shops and decided to stroll a bit off the beaten path to take in one last piece of history. If you go to Salem, you will find a building called the Witch House. It is the only building still standing with any ties to the 1692 witch trials, and the only one you can actually tour. I got there too late to walk through the restored structure, but from what I was told, it's worth it. The home belonged to one of the witch trial's judges, Jonathan Corwin, son of arrest warrants and hanger of the accused. Right next to this building is a church, noted to be the first congressional church in America. It's a beautiful building in its own right. By the time I got there, the tours had already ended for the day and the house was closed. Nevertheless, I took a stroll around the property, looking at the structure of the building marveling at the architecture. I've always been fascinated by early American history like that. Walking around the back of the building, near the entrance door, I noticed something protruding from the pile of orange and yellow leaves at my feet. Something glimmering against the artificial street lights. Bending down, I brushed the leaves to the side and picked the object up. It was a bracelet perhaps one belonging to a child. It was not overly fancy, 
not unlike some of the charms and such found throughout the stores right there in town. What appeared to be hemp was woven into a rectangular pattern, intertwined with three black rocks. The weaving was probably three inches long and an inch or so wide, with each of the rocks fitting in it, spaced evenly. Coming out from the rectangle were thin woven cords, about four inches long on either side. It wasn't visibly striking, had some dirt smudges on it, and in truth looked rather plain. Still, I thought maybe, in the sunlight with a little cleaning, the rocks might really shine in the light of day. So I stuck it in my pocket and decided I would clean it up and give it to my girlfriend the next time I saw her. After a few more minutes looking at the witch house, I decided to head back to the car. Initially, I had planned on walking around the church grounds, but have since decided against it. I didn't want to be traipsing around private property as it was getting darker. I left Salem, had a drive through for dinner, and went back to my hotel. Once I had put down my cheeseburger and fries, I flipped the TV back on in hopes to find another old horror movie to watch until I went to sleep. I cleaned out my pockets, putting my keys, wallet, and everything else on the hotel desk. That is when I noticed the bracelet sitting within that pile of everyday items. Picking it up again, I looked at it in the brighter lights of the hotel. The black rocks did have a nice shine from them after all, and the woven bracelet itself was not as dirty as originally thought. After turning the modest jewelry over in the light a couple times, I decided I'd keep it for myself. A souvenir of my trip to Salem. I wrapped the thin cords together under my right wrist, just tight enough that the rock display would not flip around underneath my arm, but stay facing outward. I had to leave a little loop in the knot though. I didn't think a hem bracelet would look terribly professional for my interview in the morning, so I planned to take it off. I changed into something to sleep in, lay on the bed watching TV. I quickly drifted off. That's when things got weird. I woke up later, in the middle of the night. I was laying flat on my back, staring towards the ceiling. Strange, because I was normally a side sleeper, and it felt weird to wake up that way. The television had turned itself off, and it was pitch black in the room. The room was uncomfortably warm as well, like the heat had been cranked up while I was sleeping. I kicked off the blankets, as the sheets and comforter flopped around, while I tried to uncover myself. The faintest smell of rotten eggs almost sulfur-like, drifted into my nose. My legs felt heavy. So did my shoulders. My face was pouring with sweat. My right wrist was burning a little where I had put on the bracelet. Assuming I was having a bit of an allergic reaction to the fibers on it, I attempted to roll over and remove it. That is when I realized I could not roll to the left or the right. In fact, my upper body wouldn't move at all. I could turn my head and move my legs, but it seemed my upper torso had been strapped to the bed. I instantly thought of sleep paralysis, but recall reading somewhere that that affected the entire body. This was different. Scared, I rolled my head to the right to see what time it was, only to find that the bedside clock was no longer on. I figured there was a power outage in the hotel. I didn't know if it was my fear or actually occurring, but the temperature in the room seemed to rise quickly. It almost felt as though my feet were burning, a feeling you get when walking on blacktop and bare feet in the summer. That's how every ounce of exposed skin felt. My face burned as well. The sweat from earlier had evaporated my nose filled with a stronger version of the rotten stench from earlier. It was overpowering now. 
that's when I saw the form. Black and slick, silhouetted against the already overwhelming darkness of the room. I could only see the shimmer of the shape, human-like but larger. It slowly rose upward, between my feet. I could almost make out what looked like shoulders, giving way to long arms with thin, wiry fingers. On top of the shoulders, I thought I saw a head. Two ruby-like objects that might have been eyes rested within that darkness. It was so hard to distinguish what I was looking at, the only distinction being shiny black on matte black. I thought I saw horns protruding, ram-like, twisted at the sides, curling back toward me from the triangle-like, but that seemed to be the creature's head. My heart was beating out of my chest. I was terrified, more so than I had ever been. I wanted to run, but my body sank like lead into the mattress. Instinctually, I wanted to kick at the form, defied if I could not flee, but my legs now suffered the same affliction as my upper torso had before. I could not even turn to look away. I was now fully paralyzed be it physically or by fear. I cannot begin to tell you how long this creature, this black mass, stood there at the foot of my bed lingering over me. But I can tell you that it felt like forever. And I could do nothing but stare at it. It never moved toward me. It never moved away. The figure just stood there. And after what seemed like hours, paralyzed against the hotel mattress, it spoke. The voice was deep, strong, and guttural. But the sound escaped almost as a whisper. One word. Chosen. And then, everything went black. When I woke, the TV was on, the clock was on, and the sun was shining through the hotel windows. Sitting bolt upright in bed, swinging my legs off the mattress into the floor, I needed to be sure that everything was in working order. It was then that I began to relax, coming to grips with the idea that I must have just had a nightmare. Until I felt the burning pain in my right wrist. Screaming out, I reached down to pull off the bracelet, once again assuming it was allergies. But the bracelet was gone. It had been replaced by red raised skin. A rectangular scar burned into my flesh and matching the item's precise fiber-like weaving with three mounds of burnt raised skin where the rocks had been tied into the bracelet. Similar marks wrapped on the underside of my arm, where I tied it together. Even the loop I left had been singed into my skin. I could still smell the stink of burning hair, but the wound looked like it had healed years ago, leaving only the scar as a reminder, but it still burned. I ran to the sink in my room, running lukewarm water over it until the pain began to subside. Slowly at first, but then virtually non-existent. I tried to compose myself, getting dressed, trying to ignore what had happened, what I had seen in the night. I forced myself to the car. Forced myself to go back to Salem and sit through the interview. Tried to put it all out of my mind. In the days and weeks that would follow, things would slowly creep back to normalcy. Of course, I bombed my interview, found out my girlfriend had a side piece, and learned that the mark on my arm would burn me to the point of tears whenever exposed to any sort of light. So I covered it, and kept it covered. The brighter the light, the worse it burns. The mark only ever sees light in the shower, where I can keep lukewarm water on it, and try to keep it cool. However, 
I even sleep in long sleeve pajamas. Just in case. I mentioned when I started how I've told the story to three other people. I guess I should lend a little clarity to that statement. The first was the psychiatrist I saw shortly after my breakup. When I found out that my college love was seeing someone else, it shattered me, tore me up really, and I found myself drinking heavily. It's funny looking back on it, seeing how life would eventually turn out. But when you're in your early 20s, you see things a hell of a lot differently than you do when you're in your mid-30s. I thought my world was crumbling around me, when in truth, all those noises of destruction were really just the sounds of doors opening, and opportunities toward a brighter future knocking. I saw the doc for about four sessions, at 150 bucks a clip. During what would turn out to be my final trip to his office, I told the shrink about the experience I had had in the hotel room outside of Salem, and about the scar on my arm. I could tell by the look on his face that he didn't believe me, and possibly thought it was a bigger loon than initially expected. He just kind of brushed the whole story off, said he'd see me the following week, and ended our session abruptly. He never even asked to look at the arm. That would be the last time he ever got from me. The second person I told was a tattoo artist in Clearwater. In the weeks leading up to my wedding, the museum sent me to Florida to meet with some of the reps at a small museum in Brandonton to learn about some of the historic exhibits they had on display. We were considering an artifact swap temporarily, and the curators in DC wanted me to further investigate. I made a weekend out of it, and spent some time on Clearwater Beach. After a few drinks one night, I got a wild hair up my ass and decided I would get a tattoo where the burn was. Sure, a wrist tattoo wasn't the most professional looking thing, but it was a hell of a lot better than the mark etched in my skin by the bracelet. Hell, I was wearing long sleeves at the time anyway. What's the difference? At least I wouldn't have to look at the scar anymore. I showed the spot to the tattoo artist and asked if he could cover it up, which of course, he said he could. I decided on something tribal, just because the design would fully circle my wrist, and hopefully cover up the entire mark. As he worked on me, I recounted the story of just how it got there, with him nodding every few sentences. I could tell he wasn't buying it. I was sure he had heard plenty of other wild tales from plenty of other customers about why they were having this or that skin blemish covered up. He never really asked any questions, just kept inking me. When we were done, he wrapped it in gauze, told me to keep the tattoo out of the sun for 24 hours, and gave me the procedures and how to keep the art clean for the next three weeks. But the artist would never know is that the next night, when I took off the protective padding, all of the ink had disappeared, leaving only the burned in bracelet that had been there before. I wish I could tell you I was shocked, but I wasn't. I knew there was more to it than just a simple scar. The third person I told was my wife, long before I had even proposed. I knew instantly that she believed me, even tearing up as I recounted the story to her. I could tell by the soothing sound of her voice and the understanding look in her eyes that she had no doubts of what I was telling her was true. But that's what love is, isn't it? Accepting your partner and all of their faults, embracing them for who they are, unconditionally. She does, and I'm forever grateful for it. I'd like to say that's the end of the story, and for a long time I thought it was. I didn't get the job with the National Park Service, and ended up staying at the museum in DC. That was ten years ago, and I'm happy to say I'm running the place now, and business is better than ever. If I'd have left for the job in Salem, I'd never met my wife, 
who came through with her first grade class one Wednesday afternoon. I'd have never slipped her my business card as they were leaving. Would have never gone on that first moonlight stroll through the mall in Washington, D.C. We'd have never had those two children that prompted me to write this story down in the first place. I never knew how I'd be as a parent. I always figured I'd struggle at it. But with her by my side, I think we're doing okay. We've tried to raise them right, to be fair, to understand the world around them as best they can and to judge people on their merits and not on their outward appearance. We've raised them in the church for the most part, although lately it's been my wife taking them. In the last few months, I found that my scar acts up when I walk on holy ground. It started with just a slight tingling, but now if I find myself sitting in the pew, it burns almost as bad as it did that first morning in a hotel in Salem. It's all I can do to hold back the tears. So, I don't go to church anymore. I'm not sleeping as much these days either. I have nightmares about the woods burning down around me, trees screaming out in pain, dreams about entire cities engulfed in flames, people leaping from buildings to avoid burning to death, howling in agony as they fall to the earth below. Here's the part that troubles me the most, though. Lately, I've had the strangest urge, almost an ache. It's the desire to procreate. Not for sex, mind you, but to actually create life. To bring forth a child. And not with my wife, with some stranger. Some filthy tramp I can fill with seed and never have to see again. I don't know where that urge is stemming from, but it's there, and it coincides with the burning pain in my scar. It's not that I want to fool around in my wife, I never want to hurt her. This feels like this is something I must do. It's commanded of me, demanded even. I feel like I must father another child upon this earth, like I must bring something forth Deep down, I know that I'm the only one that can do it. It feels like a burden rests on my shoulders. It feels like I've been chosen. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you want to see more, let me know in the comments below, and tell me what you thought of this narration. Make sure to follow me on Twitter for updates, and if you'd like to get early videos, shoutouts, and much much more, I'd appreciate it if you check out my Patreon page. It's a place where you can help support my channel while getting awesome rewards in the process, and every pledge helps out a ton, no matter the size. So if you'd like to see all the rewards I offer and consider becoming a patron, it'd mean a ton to me if you'd click the link in the description and just check it out. And don't forget to show some love to the amazingly talented authors who make these narrations possible. Have a good night everybody. Cheers.